Hello and welcome to the University of Michigan Sound Support 2022 Parent Summer Series. We have today the second of three parent webinars we've prepared for this the summer. My name is Kelly Starr. I'm one of the speech language pathologists here at U of M's cochlear implant program. As you may know, Sound Support's an outreach grant funded by the University of Michigan Department of Otolaryngology and Michigan Medicaid. The grant's designed to provide outreach to children with hearing loss and their families throughout Michigan. We've put together this series of webinars for parents due to the great responses from past series. If you have any questions, please email soundsupport at odo-soundsupportci at med.umich.edu. Today's parent webinar is titled Leveling the Playing Field, Sports and Hearing Loss. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our presenters today, Brandy Griffin and Patricia Purcell. Brandy Griffin is an audiologist here at our cochlear implant program, and Dr. Patricia Purcell is a pediatric otolaryngologist here at U of M and is also part of our cochlear implant team. Dr. Griffin will be providing part one of this topic, followed by Dr. Purcell with part two. And with that, I will hand it over to Brandy to get started. Hello, it's game time. Thanks for joining me today to talk everything sports. Putting this talk together, I was thinking of all of our amazing athletes with cochlear implants from Michigan Medicine. We have Olympic swimmers and triathletes, Ironman competitors, basketball, baseball, softball players, competitive snowmobile racers, and I'm sure I'm missing some. Uh, but really, we've seen it all here, and it's always exciting to hear the amazing stories of sport from our implant recipients. Um, so to those of you who have already tackled access and playing sports with the cochlear implant, great job. We really appreciate all your stories and feedback that you bring in to us. Um, so we all know that sports and physical activity in general reduces stress, reduces frustration, it boosts self-confidence, and it really helps with our mental health. So the long-term benefits of an active lifestyle can't be stressed enough. And there's plenty of research that supports that. So I'm really glad to be talking about this today. Um, you know, the title of the talk, Level the Playing Field, is, is a great title, uh, but I didn't come up with it on my own. It was just a really common commonly used quote that I came across again and again in regards to the need for equity in sports for kids with hearing loss. Now notice that I said equity and not equality and they're different and so I really want to talk about that today. Um, there we go. So equality versus equity. A nice reference I found was from RISE or the Ross Initiative in Sports for Equality. My daughter's high school offered this program to their athletes and it was really good. Their explanation they provided was great. Equality is giving everyone the same pair of shoes. Equity is giving everyone a pair of shoes that fits. Another way uh, to describe it or to show you really is equality means that each player has the same opportunity. So by being given the same cube, Equality means everyone is treated the exact same way regardless of their differences. Equity recognizes that we don't all begin in the same place. Some people face more challenges or adverse conditions, making it more challenging with the same effort to achieve the same goals. Equity means everyone is provided with what they need to succeed. So, there are different concepts, and really, when we're talking about this subject, we're really talking about the need for equity and equality. Getting hearing impaired kids what they need to succeed in sports and removing those barriers faced by people who are already involved or wanting to be involved in a sport. It's about changing the culture of the sport to one that you know, values diversity and enables the full involvement of disadvantaged groups in every aspect of the sport. Now, a lot of information today is a compilation of numerous resources we found. I've marked them throughout the talk with our yellow star that you see here. And here are the topics we'll cover in general today. 
And I'll think you'll, I think you'll find that the resources will be the most helpful. Um, I know, you know, looking into this topic, I, I really found them useful. And you might consider this talk more of a, a book review, really, as most of the talk is presenting information taken from this book, Time Out, I Didn't Hear You, written by Dr. Katherine Palmer and partners from the University of Pittsburgh and the University of South Dakota. The book was published in 1996 and then updated in 2016. It's a fantastic resource, really, uh, for high school athletes with hearing loss and their parents, coaches, and educational audiologists to address the gaps in equity. Uh, the goal of the book was to provide a resource that could assist in leveling the playing field with, while respecting the rules of the sport. And are you ready for this? It addresses each sport specifically. And I mean badminton, rugby, wrestling, water polo, it does it by sport, which is really nice. And obviously, being you know 2022, you can build on those ideas even more. And I'll provide you a direct link for uh, for the book to download as well. So let's lace up and look at some different general considerations for hearing impaired athletes from Dr. Palmer. Now, first up, you see here communication strategies. And now, not to worry, it's not what you're thinking with regards to communication strategies. It's the sports talk edition, and we're going to consider the laws and how they pertain to equity in sports, barriers to communication, and access to communication, all as it pertains to sport. All right, so first up, the laws, the laws that protect your athlete's uh, legal rights to communication. Um, let's talk about them. I know it's not real exciting, uh, but it's important to understand, um, at least generally speaking, what they mean and, and uh, why they're important. So there's three main federal laws that govern how states and public agencies provide services and accommodations to children with disabilities, and you've heard of them. The IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, the ADA. And I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, Dr. Palmer, who again wrote the book, Time Out, I Didn't Hear You, reported that in June of 2010, the United States Government Accountability Office found that um, students with disabilities were 56% less likely to play sports. That's really sad. And then in uh, 2013, the Department of Education found that one of the main reasons for this lack of participation and inclusion was that professionals and students and families just weren't aware of the students' rights to accommodations uh, that make athletic activities more accessible. So we really do need to um, focus on those or at least know resources to go and, and find this information. So in the book, um, each law is addressed as it pertains to athletic activities. And in general, each law states that students with hearing loss should have the same access as other students. So for example, if there's a soccer team for students at the school, the student with hearing loss should have the same right as any other student to try out for the team, equality. If a successful tryout though is dependent upon the student being able to hear certain instructions, then whatever reasonable accommodation or assistance is needed for those instructions to be understood by the child with hearing loss, they must be provided, and so that's equity. So the use of the assistive listening devices or different communication strategies, if you know an interpreter is needed, those are meant to level the playing field for these students. And so the book goes into much more detail with each law. With regards to getting special services at school, you're all familiar with the IEP or the Individualized Education Plan. And under the IDEA, each child must have this contract or IEP. So it was suggested that once it's known that a student is uh, gonna participate in this sport or extracurricular activity, the parents should notify the team in writing and then encourage the team to include recommendations in the IEP plan for communication access, considering tryouts, practice, competition, and even spectating. And what about transportation of the athlete? So really, 
the idea is to think about all aspects of communication and what that student might need and put that into writing for the IEP team. If we look at the Section 504, it states that no one with a disability can be excluded from participation in a sport or be discriminated against, and that students with hearing loss should have accessibility and equal opportunity under Section 504. So it's important that school districts provide students with disabilities an equal opportunity to participate in these sports that the district offers. And this may mean making reasonable accommodations to afford this opportunity to the students. If we look at uh, the ADA, Title II of the ADA specifically addresses the obligations of the school board to remove any communication barriers for individuals um, with hearing loss. It requires them to provide auxiliary aids to afford an individual with a disability an equal opportunity to participate in and enjoy the benefits of this program or sport. And then it goes further to say the auxiliary aid could be identified as a, a sign language interpreter, a note taker, assistive listening devices, or other effective methods of making language available to individuals with hearing loss. Okay, so to support this, so all of those work together in really supporting the legal rights to communication uh, for the kids with hearing loss, athletes with hearing loss. Um, the first resource here listed, it also talks more about the lack of participation in sports and even PE in schools, but it also gives recommendations for schools and special educational uh, administrators to work with the district to provide opportunities to kids with disabilities. All right, so let's move on to barriers. Barriers to communication. So communication will be even more challenging due to each of the barriers listed here. As you and your student are working with the coaches, officials, and schools, you need to think of how to overcome each of these barriers or at least prepare strategies for when they do interfere with communication. And the player and coaches should consider each aspect of the specific sport because it's different for every sport. For example, distance. Okay, distance probably will be an issue for field hockey because of the large field size and because they're not going to be able to have easy access to uh, the whistles from the officials starting the game, timeouts, timeout whistles, uh, calls from the coaches on the sideline, calls from the coaches to sub in and out, teammate huddles. It's going to be difficult, but probably not so difficult for badminton, right? So that's distance. Think about it with regards to your own sport. Visibility with the loss of visual cues imposed by the game or opponents or due to the distance, you know, your visibility is less. It could be a problem for football, maybe not an issue for golf. Mobility. Um, let's see. So with the need to move around quickly, it could impact basketball communication, but maybe not volleyball. So consider each barrier and how it impacts your own specific sport. And by considering each barrier, you know, you and the athlete can be prepared with a strategy to overcome it when it does happen. Noise. Um, we know that the level of noise will mask the signal. Um, it could be, the noise could be wind, crowds, coaches, or just poor acoustics in the room like a gym. Um, could be a problem for basketball, maybe not for weightlifting. So I hope you get the idea about thinking of these barriers for each sport. Language. Does the student understand the vocabulary involved with the sport? Can they follow directions with multiple steps? So there are numerous ideas and ways to work through each of these situations. And in the book, there's a chart um, sport specific to help guide you in these situations where an accommodation for your sport may be needed. Again, use this resource from 2016 kind of as a springboard for your specific sport today, um, like to a new and updated version in 2022.
And we're going to address each of these in the next few slides. So as we talk about possible solutions for each of these barriers, I'm listing them. Um, they're going to be grouped based upon distance and noise, wet and sweat, and keeping the device on barriers. OK, so stepping up to home plate are distance and noise. So overcoming distance, hearing the coaches, teammates and officials, it's it's going to be challenging. So overcoming them. Uh, some solutions might include remote mic technology, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this. You've, you've heard about it in the school setting, similar to the FM system in school. This technology overcomes both distance to a degree and environmental noise. So the distance is about 82 feet. So if you're thinking uh, football or field hockey where the field is huge, that's not going to work. But basically, the coach wears a small microphone, which transmits his voice wirelessly into your athlete's cochlear implant, overcoming the distance. It also helps with noise because you're putting that direct sound straight into the person's ear over all the background noise. So using this can, technology can be easy, but again, you and your athlete would need to coach the coach and other teammates to provide instructions on how to use it. Um, you could consider, if, if it's a bilateral recipient, using the remote mic technology in one ear and leaving the other ear open. You could consider changing the mixing ratio where the coach and the environmental mics are the same or put the coach's mic louder than the environmental mic. So you're going to hear that coach uh, more dominant and louder than all the noise on the field. You could consider using the remote mic technology with hand signals. And you could also consider increasing sensitivity on the processor for game time. So basically, you know, if it's under a helmet, that microphone sensitivity might uh, reach out farther, uh, maybe to prevent the muffling of the sound and to pick up more sound. Um, hand signals. Did you know, I didn't know this, but William Ellsworth Hoy, whose baseball career was in the later 1880s, uh, played center field and is remembered not only for having been the very talented, but because he is regarded as the best deaf baseball player in history. Not only that, but a lot of people say that as a direct result of Hoy, that's why we see such emphatic gestures from umpires to signal, signal uh, balls, strikes, safe, you know, or out calls, not to mention uh, gestures from base coaches to signal plays. Uh, he was baseball's third deaf player, uh, but the first non-pitcher. Uh, he uh, definitely had, like, other pitchers had uh, difficulty finding his strike zone, and he was a fantastic center, uh, center fielder, as I said. Uh, Cy Riggler was an umpire from 1906 to 1935, and he's also responsible for inventing and using hand signals for ball strikes and outs, so outfielders could see calls more clearly. So think of hand signals for other sports um, to be used by coaches, teammates, and even officials. Your athlete and coach and teammates can make predetermined signals to help during the game. The player should expect a signal from the teammate or coach. Uh, the team could be coached to always point to the coach when they hear the buzzer or whistle to alert the player to the call during the game. Um, one hand signal I would encourage you to create and use would be a signal for everyone to know if the device has fallen off. So we want to prevent damage to the device, but also keep the athlete safe and to alert others that he can't hear and he may actually need to come out of play. Um, alerting devices, audible ones, warning signals, whistles, buzzers. While they're already used in games, it's a good, a good idea to check with officials to be sure it won't interfere with play. So could you potentially uh, have a, 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 a different audible horn or something indicating uh, to that player that there's a play or a call that's been uh, called? Uh, light indicators. Could you use different colored flags? signs, uh, lights, even warning signs for safety. Tactile uh, alerting devices, you know, to be considered, you know, if the athlete should choose not to wear the device during a game, 
hand signals and alerting devices would then be necessary for the player. Um, but you should also consider the use of, of a sign on athletes' clothing to indicate that they can't hear. And so, for example, we have a triathlete who chooses not to use his device uh, at times for the biking event. And so he wears a vest, which says that he's hearing impaired. And he also uses a, a, a rear view mirror so that he can see traffic behind him. So different uh, considerations and solutions. Moving on to moisture and sweat. So moisture and sweat happen. And during sports season, just get in the habit of using the dry box. Don't neglect this part. You wanna keep your desiccants new and just do it like Nike, right? Um, bring your portable dry kit with you change your mic covers you know stock up for athletes you need to change these mic covers more often if you're a sweaty mess during your sport you could consider using your older generation or your older technology uh, backup device for sports or just be prepared to let your new device dry out after your sport and carry your backup with you to prevent excessive moisture you could also consider the use of the aqua device Although I know it, retention is an issue uh, with these, we'll get there next to have some ideas, but um, each manufacturer has an aqua device to allow your implant to be completely waterproof. Um, and you have to use each of those with the rechargeable batteries. But since all devices have them, I want you to, I want to tell you kind of an extra about these that they each have a certain IP water rating. Um, so it just means ingress protection. And the scale is from zero to eight and it's just the international standard that they have. So the two numbers, the first number is for solid objects or particles um, to getting into the implant, and the second one is for a short period of water immersion, one and a half uh, meters underwater for up to 30 minutes. So, um, for example, the N7 speech processor from Cochlear, without the Aqua device, has a rating of IP57, so dust and dirt protection of a five and moisture of a seven. But with the aqua device on, it goes up to an, a rating of IP68. And that's actually a very good standard um, for being waterproof. Uh, this device, it can, or that aqua can be used up to 50 times. The sonnet from Medell without the aqua device is an IP rating of uh, 54 and with the IP, the aqua device it's a 68 again very very good you can only use uh, those three times each okay from advanced bionics the neptune which is just designed for water has the rating of ip68 it's a body body worn device and so most people don't usually use that on a daily basis uh, but for the new marvel the battery um, also has a rating of an IP68, and it can be used again and again, year after year. So, you know, obviously the battery will, will deplete over time, but that one can be used again and again. And it's also off the ear uh, when you put it in that Aqua device. So without the Aqua sleeve for the AB device, it has a rating of an um, IP22. All right. so. There's also a, a time limit for being underwater and a depth. Um, so if you consider scuba diving, it might be a little more complicated. But otherwise, those are really good ratings and aqua uh, protection. Let's see. That. Now, the IP rating doesn't account for sweat, but many patients come in and we've heard that because of the water rating on some processors, without the aqua device, that after your sweaty sport, it would be appropriate to take the implant off, quickly rinse it under the water to get the salt from your sweat off, and then put it back on. So it can get wet, right? It just doesn't like the salt from your sweat. So take it off, rinse it off, and then you can put it back on. And that's obviously if you're not using the aqua device. Other options for sweat might be to use ear gear. This is a neoprene sleeve and it's got a clip to prevent losing it. Um, and that works really well to you know, absorb all that moisture. But many families tell us that uh, after your sport, you need to remove it quickly because that sleeve will just be drenched with uh, sweat moisture. Okay. 
sports headbands or hats just to keep that speech processor off the ear where all that sweat is um, can also be helpful. I tell you, Etsy has everything. So I would encourage you to go there and, and look at all the different options for um, keeping that moisture and sweat off your ear, off the implant. So how do you keep the Aqua device on for swimming? That has been an issue we hear a lot in the office. Um, with swimming, you can attach your processor to the goggles with that Aqua device. You could use a swim cap to hold it in place. There's images here for you to see. And you can also clip that um, speech processor in the hair in the Aqua device. You could also use a headband or it's called an ear bandit to help secure it on the head. And again, Etsy uh, really has a lot of different options and you just have to find what works best for you. So keeping it on in general, um, for many sports, a sports headband can be worn and do kind of double duty, which works to uh, wick away the moisture and hold the device on the head. Um, again, Etsy you see here is a great resource, um, but many parents recently have been coming in raving about this new CI retention seen here. It's got the two hair clips, so you can secure the coil cable, and which helps then secure also the processor. So you could actually do both to help keep it on. Wig tape is a double-sided, skin-friendly tape that can help with retention, but with a lot of sweat, it would likely come off pretty easily. Um, you can get that at different beauty stores. You could consider an ear mold to help hold the device on the ear. And here you see a safety line connecting to the, the hearing aid to the glasses. Again, this was found on Etsy, but just another way to hold it on. Full 90 soccer gear not only helps with concussion safety, but also uh, with retention. The snug fit can be uh, bent and shaped to the ear and help it stay on. Safety lines are always an easy extra way to be sure that you don't lose it. Skull caps and pilot caps help with retention as well. Um, I think we mentioned this before, but you know, should your con athlete consider not wearing their device during the game, you might consider some way to let other people know that they're not hearing. So an, a vest might be uh, helpful. All right, well, finally, we've made it to access to communication. And uh, let's, let's just dive right in. So the student with hearing impairment should be able to access whatever communication students with normal hearing are accessing, spoken or sign or cued speech. We've been over that and we've talked about that already. But there's another aspect of this, and this is where you or your student will really need to reach out and communicate with the coach about how to make that happen. Whether it's by a discussion or providing them written materials or putting it in the IEP, your student needs access to communication. So for example, if it's known that uh, the student with an implant uh, or sign language interpreter is going to participate in a school sport, it's the school's responsibility um, to contact the governing body of over athletics in the state to get a letter stating that this accommodation is allowed. The letter then could be carried by the coach so in the, in the event that they're questioned by an official, they have that documentation. As a side note, you know, rules for club teams not associated with a school, with a school might have a different protocol, but uh, getting a letter under the ADA that the student should still be allowed to access to information with accommodations in order to participate um, would be really helpful. For travel sports, you, you really want to consider you know, communication during transportation, during overnight stays in a hotel. Um, those are important for accessibility. Communication with others. You and your student need to decide what coaches, parent volunteers and officials and other players need to know and be sure that they have it, enough information to help, and not just minutes before a game or practice, but at the beginning of the year or beginning of the sport. And as mentioned before, you know, schedule a meeting, provide written information, 
demonstrate the way you want the coach and players and officials to communicate with you with the student during the tryouts, during the practice, and during the competition. Um, if we think about it, this could be a great lesson in self-advocacy for students with hearing loss. Everyone is different, but for a positive experience, you could also consider coaching the coach. Most coaches and officials will need to understand the impact a hearing loss has on the player's ability to hear and understand the calls being made. They also need to understand their responsibility to implement or permit that required accommodation to the student. Remember, coaches are busy. So remember that when coaching them, um, you really want to give them time and access to written materials to go over it you know, late at night at home when they're looking at the games and the playbooks for the next day. Finally, you know, consider notifying the officials prior to the game so that they're more easily accepting of the strategies or accommodations being used for the students or the athletes. And by giving them the officials and the teammates information ahead of time, they're going to be more willing to help out. Now, some of you might be wondering, um, what about the use of sign language? And this isn't addressed in each sports chapter. Um, it's just generally brought up in the book. But if a, stu a student uses sign language to give or receive communication, then an interpreter will be required during tryouts, practice, and competition, and travel. And how much interpreting is necessary should be determined by the student and the coach and the rules of the sport. And it's, it's also necessary to believe that students who use sign language for communication may also still need other assistive devices for alerting signals. So remember, our goal here is that the student with hearing impairment should be able to access whatever communication the students with normal hearing are accessing. So I'd like to share a story with you story or a case with you, not just to highlight sign language, but really to highlight the different considerations throughout the story as well as the outcome. There was uh, a case here in Michigan when a high school wrestler with a cochlear implant was competing in his wrestling matches. And for safety reasons, he didn't wear his external speech processor, obviously leaving him unable to hear the coach or the referee. And so, um, he used a sign language interpreter. And so during the non-sanctioned sanctioned competitions, he was using his interpreter provided by the school district, and the interpreter was allowed to move freely around the perimeter of the wrestling circle on the mat so that the athlete could maintain eye contact with the interpreter regardless of the body position during the match. And if you think about wrestling, remember they're being flipped and, and they're looking at all uh, areas of the mat. So what happened is that during an MHSAA sanctioned competition, the interpreter was restricted to the coach's box at the corner of the mat where he was often out of the athlete's line of sight. So the athlete uh, couldn't access instructions, instructions from the coach, he couldn't uh, get information from the referee, and oftentimes he didn't even know when the matches started and ended. So the MHSAA argued that the intent of limiting the in interpreter to the coach's box was uh, for safety, to prevent a collision between the interpreter and the wrestlers or the referee. Um, so the athlete filed a lawsuit after a whole year of working through this. They filed a lawsuit in a federal district court against MHSAA, alleging violations of Section 504, ADA, and the Michigan Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act. As we talked about earlier, a reasonable accommodation is supported by Section 504, ADA, and if it's written into the IEP, mandated. So. Let's see, in the story, it was noted that an OCR, Office of Civil Rights, um, Dear Colleague letter written in 2013, um, had already addressed guidance and even given examples of easy to impl implement modifications for athletes to compete in and participate in sports. This is the interesting part. They also approached 
disability related disputes in court with these considerations. And these are the ones I wanted to talk to you about. So in considering this accommodation, uh, regardless of what it is, but in this case, it was the sign language interpreter, would it fundamentally alter the sport or change the nature of the sport? Would it uh, put an undue financial or administrative burden on the school? And would it call a safety, cause a safety or health risk concern? And so in this story, the use of the interpreter around the mat would not change the nature of the sport, would not cause excessive burden on the school district or governing body, and would not impact the safety of the athlete interpreter or the official. And so the athlete won the case and was able to, again, use his requested accommodation uh, to uh, compete in his wrestling matches. So I really think it's just a good story with a good example of an accommodation need, an accommodation request. Um, it's a good example of uh, maybe a lack of understanding on that governing body about <clears throat> a student with disabilities. And then again, it's a good outcome with additional information about uh, considerations for schools to consider with regards to fundamentally changing the sport an undue uh, burden on the school or governing body and safety and health health risks. So the resources about uh, on this slide, the first one is about the story and the second one is the outcome of this case. And then the third is the letter from the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. Well, sports, pan, sports fans, enough heavy, no hocus pocus, just focus now. It's important to remember that with all recreational activity in sports, there are just risks kids face with or without a cochlear implant. And for sports, I think it's also important to remember that we all sign that paper with regards to concussion awareness, as well as understanding the possible risks for playing sports. And so it's a risk for everyone, even without cochlear implants or hearing aids. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting to put up here a look at the top 10 recreational activities with the highest number of head injuries among children 14 and younger. Look at that. And as we noted, uh, it was noted before that uh, this incidence is actually underreported. And so it doesn't really reflect those number of kids that are treated by family doctors or other professionals. And I bring this up to continue this thought of safety, you know, like the story just just talked about a little bit. Um, and with regards to safety, but also uh, a note from Dr. Palmer from Time Out, I Can't Hear You. You know, typically we have to have athletes get a sign off by the physician, you know, um, stating that it's OK to participate in sports. But in the case for a, an athlete with hearing loss, it's also maybe important to consult your uh, otologist or your ENT who's managing their medical care. And the reason is that there are certain types of hearing loss that put a student at higher risk for sustaining more, a greater degree of hearing loss or even balance problems if they receive a blow to the head. Okay, so one example might be EVA or enlarged vestibular aqueduct. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that the student can't participate, but it may mean that they need to maybe consider a sport where head trauma is, is a lot lower. Um, and along these lines of safety, I'm excited to tell you that one of our surgeons will be doing a part two to the sports talk um, to get the lowdown so that we can get the lowdown on the medical surgical aspect and considerations for playing sports with cochlear implants. So be on the look uh, for part two. You know, generally speaking, having a cochlear implant won't affect the ability to play sports. Any sport is good as long as the implant is not directly hit. Um, that can happen. So really, you want to protect your implant system and protect your head. So let's jump into helmets. Safety first helmets are important. And most importantly is this first point, that modifying a helmet to fit the speech processor inside, like removing straps or padding, it's just a bad idea. Um, each sport has a different helmet requirements 
due to the type and force and actually frequency of the possible impact. So altering the energy absorbing characteristics of the helmets would decrease protection against physical head trauma. Additionally, it might, also, might not only cause damage to the speech processor, but it could increase the risk um, to damage the skin and the skull in the area of the device. And I've seen that happen from a, a young person wearing her speech processor got hit right here on the speech processor and the skin broke down underneath. So it's really important not to change uh, the helmet. Um, but once you pick your helmet, make sure that all of the adjustments like tightness and position on the head are set correctly. And if there's a big risk of blows to the head or the external parts, you might consider taking it off. Word on the street. What we've heard in the clinic about helmets, and I want to make a note here that none of these are endorsed by Michigan Medicine or the implant program. Um, it's just simply what recipients come in and talk to us about. So we want to just pass these on to you. Interestingly, one of, only one of the helmets here is designed to specifically fit a cochlear implant, and that is the Riddell helmet for football which is interesting because generally speaking, football is not recommended or the best sport to play with an implant, but many patients do and there are specific instructions for getting this helmet and I've listed them here for you to take a look at. Uh, the, the Zenith X1 helmets have been recommended and work for baseball and motorcycles and even football. Um, let's see here. For soccer, this full 90 headband, I mentioned it before, it's useful for concussions from the sport, but also provides coverage uh, to the crucial impact zones. And that actually is one of the spots where the cochlear implant will be. So that's actually a really good uh, resource for soccer. Biking, a lot of patients have come in and talked about the adjustability and fit of the Giro helmet. And then for the same reasons, the Mizuno brand uh, for softball helmets. So here's the gold. Here's the resource to download uh, the, the different high school and the college edition books. I'm going to leave you with these resources from your cochlear implant manufacturer. I'm going to leave you with these additional resources from different uh, groups that also have great information about sports and cochlear implantation. Hot off the press, if you're interested in being a part of the potential research, research study looking at creating a helmet for sports, please uh, use this QR code and it's just basically a sign up to be added to the list to get more information when this research study is is uh, presented. And that's the game, folks. Please be sure to watch for part two from our surgeon coming soon. And thanks so much for your time. If you have additional questions um, or concerns, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. And there's my email, and then also there's the sound support email as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brandy. We now have Dr. Patricia Purcell for part two of this discussion for a level of playing field. And if there are questions following Dr. Purcell's presentation, you can reach out to us at odo-soundsupport.ci at med.umich.edu. Thanks. Hi, I'm Patricia Purcell. I'm an assistant professor of pediatric otolaryngology and a cochlear implant surgeon at CS Mott Children's Hospital at the University of Michigan. And today I'd like to talk to you about how to avoid injury in children with cochlear implants. Receiving a cochlear implant is an exciting event in a family's life. Their child who previously could not hear now has access to sound. But there are some risks associated with cochlear implantation, one of which is the possibility of traumatic injury to the implant. 
And so today I'd, le I'd like to talk to you more about ways to reduce this risk of injury and what to do if you have a concern that your child's implant may have been, um, may not no longer be working. So I think families often uh, appreciate the risks associated with full tackle activities, such as football and rugby. And oftentimes these sports are not a first choice for children who have a cochlear implant, just because of the risk that of a direct blow to the head that could result in um, injury to the implant. But there are some other sports that can also have associated risks um, that I wanted to make sure everyone is also aware of. So we do see children who play soccer, if they engage in header type activities where they use their head to propel the ball across the field, that this activity um, can place the implant at risk. A child, when performing a header, not only is the ball hitting their head at high velocity, but they're using their head to um, deliver a force. And if there's another player nearby or something else, um, it's possible they could strike their head um, on uh, surrounding objects. And so for this reason, um, I typically advise families, you know, if their child plays soccer, just to make sure that they are cautious or maybe do not perform header skills as part of the game. Another sport that is associated with injury, particularly for female athletes, is cheerleading. Cheerleading is responsible for um, 50 to 60 percent of all significant injury among female um, athletes. And head and neck injuries are a significant part of that risk. Um, so this would be engaging in um, activities such as throws or high pyramid formations. Um, so if your child participates in cheerleading, maybe I would uh, recommend some limits to the uh, type of tumbling activities that they, that they do. Um, and then last but not least, it's important to consider high velocity activities such as skiing, snowboarding, bicycle riding. So absolutely children need to wear helmets during these activities. Um, helmets have been shown to reduce the risk of head trauma by 50 to 60% in children who wear them um, when skiing, but it, you know, the risk is not zero. So it would be uh, important for a child to engage in these activities at a, at a level that is safe for their skill um, and to uh, take care when trying to advance their skills, um, perhaps avoiding um, uh, uh, significant uh, tumbling type uh, activities with skiing or snowboarding. Um, activities where they would be jumping or, um, you know, uh, rotating or twisting in the air. That being said, you know, we are, as a cochlear implant team, we want to encourage children to engage in sports because that is an important part of healthy living. And so um, by just taking some precautions, we found that children who have cochlear implants can typically do um, most of what they want to do and do it quite well. So you may have some questions about the specifics of how traumatic injuries can happen to a cochlear implant. And so I wanted to provide a little more detail about that as well. So as you are probably aware, your child's cochlear implant can consists of both external and internal parts. And so the external part you're quite familiar with, this is what you see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the uh, external magnet, the coil and the speech processor. The internal parts are placed at the time of surgery. And similarly, there is a magnet, there is a receiver portion, and there's an electrode. And you can see the cur curly Q tip on the electrode which is the portion that sits within the cochlea. 
So obviously we don't want to damage the external processor, um, but if it is damaged, it can be replaced. There may be some expense associated with replacement, but if you feel that your child's external processor is no longer working after um, a contact activity, please alert your cochlear implant team so that it can be, so we can do some troubleshooting and perhaps provide a replacement. Things are a little more complicated if the internal parts are damaged by a traumatic injury. So as I mentioned, there are several components to the internal part and each of these is susceptible to injury in a different way. For example, the magnet portion of the implant could shift or displace under the scalp. And if that were to happen, it may be uncomfortable or perhaps even impossible to apply the external processor to the magnet, depending on how it shifted. And so that's um, uh, one reason to avoid a direct blow to that area. The receiver portion of the implant could crack or break and that could disrupt the electronics within it. And that could be a catastrophic uh, event for that uh, implant and it would need to be uh, replaced and re-implantation would have to be performed. Finally, the electrode, the portion that sits within the cochlea, if there's a hard enough blow, that electrode could dislodge out of the cochlea. If that were to happen, the implant would not be able to transmit any signal to the auditory nerve, and so the implant would not function. The only solution in that situation is to replace the implant and insert a new electrode into the cochlea. Now, it's important to know that the time window for when we can do the reinsertion into the cochlea may be fairly short because the cochlea could scar um, and make it very difficult to reinsert an electrode. And so that's where it's important for your cochlear implant team to be notified if you have any concerns that your child's implant is no longer working well. So to summarize some recommendations, receiving a cochlear implant is an exciting event. Um, and with some uh, uh, basic precautions, it, can, it is a very safe um, uh, procedure uh, with uh, most patients experiencing years and years of productive wear. But that being said, it's important for children who have cochlear implants to be careful with high contact activities. Um, and we reviewed some of the higher risk activities earlier today. It's also important for them to wear a helmet when appropriate and to definitely alert your cochlear implant team if you have any concerns that the implant is no longer functioning. Thank you for taking the time to learn about cochlear implant safety today. Please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Purcell for those presentations on sports and hearing loss. If you have further questions, you can reach out to Sound Support through the email listed below. And um, look forward to our next parent webinar, which will be released in a few weeks. And it's titled, Let's Map Understanding Your Child's Programming Appointment. Thanks.